All right, we've got big breaking news coming in. India and China have agreed on disengagement along the line of actual control. Usually, if there is a major event or a major announcement, or both the countries would actually do a simultaneous or a joint announcement or a joint statement. The lack of a joint statement, you know, leads to all kinds of questions. And the lack of details from the Indian side does raise suspicions about what actually are these arrangements, because these words have been very carefully chosen. Absolutely critical is this question of the Quad. And if China can warm up its relationship with India, it can potentially put a wedge in between the Indians and other Quad members. That may be overstating it, but I think in many respects, there is a lot of precedent for an autonomous Indian foreign policy that does not fully align with the U.S. and Europe. And we see that with the Indian-Russian relationship that the U.S. has not been happy about for not just now, but for many decades as well. And it doesn't even have to be a full, they don't all have to be like holding hands and skipping, you know, kind of like it, it's more a situation of every little slight or every little mistake being taken as a confirmation of the other one being a full enemy. Like retreating back from that kind of default position, I think, you know, kind of would already be very helpful, I think, for the rest of the world. Somehow there's been a mistaken belief in DC, particularly in a certain section of people who dominate the government and the think tank read that somehow India is anti-China and being anti-China is the only way India can exist and thrive. And therefore there is something where, where the United States must work with India, even if there are other issues. And I'm sure that today's announcement is likely to raise questions in Washington DC about whether India is committed to being anti-China or India is anti-China but only because it has certain disputes in the border which have not been resolved. The China Global South podcast is supported in part by the Africa-China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg and by our subscribers. Thank you. If you'd like to subscribe for daily news and exclusive analysis about every aspect of China's engagement in Africa, Asia, and throughout the developing world, go to chinaglobalsouth.com forward slash subscribe. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China Global South podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Podcast Network. I'm Eric Olander in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam, and as always, I'm joined by China Global South's managing editor, Kobus van Staden, from beautiful Cape Town, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, in a remarkable coincidence, we were going to talk about China-India affairs today, and by coincidence, massive breaking news just crossed the line before we went on the air today. Let's take a listen. All right, we've got big breaking news coming in. India and China have agreed on disengagement along the line of actual control. Uh, both India and China will restart patrolling along the LAC. An agreement we hear has been reached on disengagement. Patrolling will begin on both sides and both have mutually agreed to disengage. This comes after a lot of attempts to go ahead and have dialogue from both sides. Patrolling arrangements, uh, as per the latest reports, have been brought for disengagement and resolution of the situation. Now, this is the news that's been dominating the headlines all afternoon across the Indian media. Not a lot of details coming out of the Chinese press. Seems to be much more constrained on their sides. Let me just back up a little bit kind of set the stage for what happened. This all dates back to 2020 in the period of May and June when Chinese and Indian troops confronted one another high in the Himalayas along their disputed border. These skirmishes with batons, it was really just almost medieval in the way they actually approached one another and, and fought with one another, really sent China-India relations into a deep freeze. And for the past four years, ties between these two Asian powers have been toxic, acidic. They've all but broken off. There are no more direct flights. There's no more journalists in each other's countries. There's no more students in each other's countries. The two leaders over the past several years could barely look at each other, much less talk to one another when they were at summits. Just in fact, at the BRICS summit last year in Johannesburg, Xi Jinping and Narendra Modi, they did have this somewhat informal engagement. But again, you can just see the tension when they were on stage with one another. But the deaths that occurred in the Galwan Valley in May and June 2020 in an area called the Line of Actual Control, which is a huge part of this massive border between these two countries that has been in dispute. This is apparently what has been some will say resolved. We're not quite sure what it is, but let's take a listen 
to Indian Foreign Secretary Vikram Misri, who broke the news today and explained exactly what happened. I can share with you that over the last uh, several weeks, uh, Indian and Chinese uh, diplomatic and military negotiators have been in close uh, contact with each other in a variety of uh, forums. And as a result of these discussions, uh, agreement has been arrived at on uh, patrolling arrangements along the line of actual control in the India-China border areas, uh, leading to disengagement and a resolution of the issues uh, that had arisen in these areas uh, in uh, 2020. Uh, and we will be taking the next steps uh, on this. Now, Kobus, on one hand, this is, again, big news, a little bit surprising, but not a huge surprise, in, in part because last month we got word that the PLA was going to withdraw from four sectors along the line of actual control. And we had heard that these military-to-military talks that have gone on more than 30 rounds between the two sides, despite the political relationship between China and India souring, the mill-to-mill talks that were ongoing were quite positive and quite productive. And so earlier this year, we got word that these regular military dialogues had actually made some progress. Now, all of this happens One day before, and again, the timing of this announcement is also something we're going to dive into today. One day before both Xi and Modi are going to be in Russia for the BRICS summit. And it's prompting speculation that uh, Misri had to address that the two leaders may actually sit down for a bilateral meeting. As far as the questions uh, on a bilateral meeting uh, are concerned, As you know, and as I said earlier as well, uh, this is a multilateral uh, event, though of course there is uh, always a provision for uh, bilateral meetings uh, on the sidelines. Uh, We are currently looking into the overall program of the Prime Minister. There are a number of requests for bilateral meetings and we will uh, update you on uh, the bilaterals as they evolve uh, as soon as uh, feasible. And almost immediately after the news broke from Foreign Secretary Vikram Misri, External Affairs Minister S.J. Shankar was asked about it at the NDTV World Summit 2024 that was taking place in New Delhi, also on Monday. And what you're going to hear in this exchange is one of the world's most polished diplomats being very careful in his remarks with the moderator. Let's take a listen. So, will now India be able to patrol in the areas of Galwan, Depsong? No, uh, uh, you see, uh, there would be, there, there are areas uh, which, uh, for various reasons, after 2020, because uh, they had blocked us, so we had blocked them. So, what has happened is we have reached an understanding which will allow the patrolling. Uh, you, for example, you spoke uh, about Depsong, uh, you know. Uh, that's not the only place. There are other places other also. Places. So I think uh, the understanding, to my uh, knowledge, is that we will be able to do the patrolling which we were doing in 2020. So very big developments happening on the China-India side. Notably, by the way, again, some folks may be wondering, why don't we have any Chinese sound bites? Why isn't there any Chinese reaction And again, as I mentioned, the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs has been very quiet. There's been nothing in the Chinese press right now. My guess is they're probably wanting to wait and see, and they don't want to upstage Xi Jinping's arrival in Russia for the BRICS summit. When you hear this news, Kobus, what's your response? Well, it's a huge step forward, in many ways very encouraging. I mean, we'll have to see how, how it goes. And it immediately raises lots of questions. You know, it, as you said, this move also comes against the background of ongoing military conversations between the two militaries. We've also seen at the same time ongoing calls from large companies within India about the need to make it easier for Chinese personnel to come to the country and for Chinese investment to flow into India. So it is this interesting kind of moment where it seems that politics, you know, in the BJP party was for a while in conflict with other kind of flanks of the society, kind of calling for more kind of pragmatic cooperation. So it'll be very interesting to see, A, how it's launched also on the Chinese side, and B, how it's then received more broadly by the populations, because we know that, you know, that nationalism is very strong on both sides in both countries. Now, this is a a conflict that many people outside of the region didn't follow that closely, but the ramifications are absolutely enormous, given the fact that India is both a member of the BRICS, 
also the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and the U.S.-led Quad. So there's a lot of moving parts in this, and this is why I'm just thrilled today to have the opportunity to speak with Sushant Singh, who is a lecturer in the South Asian Studies Department at Yale University. Sushant is also a longtime journalist and serves as the consulting editor at The Caravan magazine in New Delhi, and he has also got an extensive background in military affairs. He was in the, in the Indian Army for 20 years, and then also an ed- a deputy editor of the Indian Express newspaper. Sushant, a very good morning to you. The timing of our discussion today could not be better, and we're thrilled to have you on the program. Uh, thank you so much, Eric. And Corbis, it is wonderful to be on your show. I'm a regular listener of your podcast, and I really enjoy listening to that. Well, thank you so much. And again, fortuitous timing that you're with us today, given what happened. Let's get your quick take. Is this important or is this yet another kind of elevation of false hopes that uh, that will you know crumble soon in, into the acrimony that has defined the China-India relationship over the past four years? No, I think this is huge. It's a huge announcement because the foreign secretary has made it. And as you just played, declared foreign minister Jay Shankar has uh, also added to it. But the fact of the matter is we do not have any details on actually what has gone around. And as you said, there's been no Chinese statement. Usually, if there is a major event or a major announcement, uh, both the countries would actually do a simultaneous or a joint announcement or a joint statement. The lack of a joint statement, you know, leads to all kinds of questions. And the lack of detail from the Indian side does raise suspicions about what actually are these arrangements, because these words have been very carefully chosen. You know, Indian media, having been part of the Indian media for a long time, having seen it at close quarters, I know that the Indian media likes to hype up a lot of this stuff, what the government says, without really passing it closely. When you look at Misri's statement, which was clearly a written statement that he was kind of reading out, he really did not give out those details. So a couple of things are jarring. One is lack of details. Secondly, no statement from China. If it is such a major breakthrough, as the Indians are saying it is, which probably it is, then there should have been a joint statement. You know, earlier when there have been disengagements in January, February 2021, in September 2021, in August 2022 or something, there have always been joint statements simultaneously released by Beijing and by the Ministry of External Affairs in Delhi. So, you know, while I do recognize that this is a major announcement and it seems like a step forward, at least from the Indian side, you know, I remain wary of what is it that the Indians have agreed with China. So why would Misri then do this? I mean, he's the foreign secretary. And again, S.J. Shankar, we heard from as well, the external affairs minister. Why wouldn't they coordinate with their Chinese counterparts to release a joint statement? Instead, we heard from Misri and from S.J. Shankar confirming that something had happened. But again, we hadn't heard anything from the Chinese. Why would they do it this way? So, Eric, if I were to put it very bluntly and harshly, this is essentially headline management before Mr. Modi meets President Xi uh, at uh, Kazan for the BRICS summit. So essentially, you know, you want to somehow grab the headlines and say everything is over between India and China. Things are perfectly fine. Disengagement has happened. Patrolling has resumed. But if you observe carefully, the one phrase which has been missing from the whole conversation has been the restoration of status quo ante as it existed before April 2020. Has that been restored or is a new status quo that has been created after 2020 over which certain arrangements have been agreed upon? Now, if those kind of questions are asked, then it will become very difficult for Mr. Modi to go ahead for his meeting with Xi Jinping in Kazan. So I think the main purpose of this is to create an environment to have a meeting and to to depict normalcy and to say everything is now perfectly fine and we can continue to go ahead with all that we have been trying to do. To answer your question in a different way, there's been a, as you know, there are many paths to the India China relationship. China is India's biggest trading partner. And despite all the restrictions that New Delhi had put on China since 2020, over the last year or so, there's been tremendous pressure from within the government, the ministries which deal with the economy and trade, and also from the corporate houses, from business houses, from companies that there should be, these arrangements should be made easier and there should be more visas given, more investment should be allowed from China. And there's been huge pressure on India to show that while the border crisis is on, how can we do this? And the government, particularly Mr. Modi, has been under tremendous pressure on this. So this announcement, in a sense, allows him to do all the other things on the Indian economy, trade with China, that otherwise would have been very difficult to pull off for his government. 
What do you make of the timing of the announcement? Particularly, you know, last week we saw External Min- Affairs Minister um, Jai Shankar going to Pakistan, being the first, uh, like, you know, Indian official at his level to go as in a, about a decade, as I understand. And it's happening like in between that and and the BRICS summit in, in Russia this week. So, wh- what do you think the role of these big summit events are in in, in the timing of, of the announcement? So, you know, definitely the BRICS summit in Kazan is an important uh, moment, is an important landmark, is an important episode in the whole saga. Is it linked to to the SEO summit for which uh, Prime Minister Modi did not visit Pakistan and instead sent uh, Foreign Minister Jashankar? One is not sure if there's a direct linkage to that, but definitely it is linked to the BRICS summit in Kazan. If you recall, even before the previous uh, BRICS summit, as Eric mentioned, in Johannesburg, there had been huge discussion around some kind of breakthrough that was expected after a meeting between Prime Minister Modi and President Xi. But that breakthrough never happened. In fact, I was told by by people on the Indian side that the meeting went off. It went off pretty ugly, and it became pretty acrimonious at the end of it. And the two sides only announced the interaction after two days. So you know, so so since then, uh, Prime Minister Modi and President Xi have not really interacted or met, met uh, since then. So this is definitely linked to the BRICS summit uh, in Kazan. But with the SCO summit in Islamabad, I don't think there is much of a linkage. The fact that India went to it. India attended the SEO summit was essentially to show that it is engaging with the multilateral body and it was trying to somehow delink itself from that there was any engagement with Pakistan at that point. Let's dive into that point you raised about the status quo because that has been a major sticking point between the two sides. And, and let me just give a little background for folks who may not be as familiar with this topic. So the Chinese wanted to move forward with relations by siloing out the different diplomatic ties and being able to table the border dispute into a different category. So they wanted to maintain normal diplomatic relations in all other categories and then put the border dispute off to the side and deal with that separately. The Indian side said, nope, we cannot have normal diplomatic relations so long as the border issue is unresolved. The status quo is not acceptable. Is that a correct assessment of the two sides? Eric, more than the diplomatic thing, it was the economic thing, actually, and the trade The economic, yes. Yes. So in that respect, then China wanted to pursue a stronger economic relationship, but again, separate that from the border issue, right? Absolutely. And the, as far as the diplomatic ties are concerned, at no point in time, India has not had an ambassador in Beijing. India has had full diplomatic ties with Beijing. In fact, it's the other way around. Beijing has not had an ambassador, as you mentioned. Uh, in Delhi for 18 months, although officials in Beijing and friends and think tankers in Beijing have told me that it had nothing to do with the ties with India. It was more due to their own internal bureaucratic structure, whatever you may make of it. So let's pick up then the motivations that Cobus was trying to get to about why now. And I'll start with the Chinese side, but I'd like to hear from you about the Indian side and why Modi may be changing his calculations now. Again, taking into account that the world today is very different than what it was even a year ago, considering the war in Ukraine and the war in the Middle East. I think that the South China Sea has something to do with this as well, that China did not like having border disputes with both India and in the South China Sea. And by resolving, or at least moving to resolve, the border dispute with India, it further isolates the Philippines. The Chinese have said with the Vietnamese, look, we can resolve these border disputes through diplomacy and negotiation. They can do that with the Indians. Then all there is are the Filipinos who are sitting out there as the ones who are being in the view of the Chinese, acrimonious, contentious, and at the behest of the Americans. So that may be part of Xi's strategy there. The other point that I think is absolutely critical is this question of the Quad. And if China can warm up its relationship with India, it can potentially put a wedge in between the Indians and other Quad members. That may be overstating it, but I think in many respects there is a lot of precedent for an autonomous Indian foreign policy that does not fully align with the U.S. and Europe. And we see that with the Indian-Russian relationship that the U.S. has not been happy about for not just now, but for many decades as well. That's my speculation as to why she may be wanting to deal now. What do you think are the calculations that Modi is thinking about. So one is that it was in, it has been pretty embarrassing for Prime Minister Modi to have this crisis on the border because he runs a very nationalist government, you know, which, which runs on this very strong man image of his, where he's going to teach anybody who looks towards India a fitting lesson in a certain sense. 
Whereas when it comes to China, he has been very timid and very shy because he does recognize the power differential between China and India. China is six times bigger economy than India. China's military's but defense budget is four, four times, three and a half times bigger than India. China is a much stronger technological power. China has much higher potential in terms of what it can do to India. So, you know, he has been very reluctant to talk about the crisis. So there has been a great desire on the government side to somehow wish it away and somehow get over with this thing because this is very, very embarrassing for him. So one is that political reason. Second is the military commitment that India has to make. So essentially, it's just not in eastern Ladakh, the portion where, where Galwan lies or where Depsang and Choka, other areas lie where the crisis began. But all over the line of actual control, which is more than 2,000 kilometers, Indians had to mobilize their troops further up or towards the border so that there were no further losses of territory to China. This has gone on for now nearly more than four years. And so this is something, this is the second thing. It does put military pressure on India. India has been forced to reorient its army, at least one strike corps and many other divisions away from the Pakistan border to the China border. And this is the first significant shift in decades that India has done. This has also meant that it is very difficult for India to threaten any kind of military activity or military operation against Pakistan, which it could do earlier. So, you know, nothing animates Mr. Modi's supporters who are Hindu nationalists more than an attack on, on Pakistan, which is a Muslim majority country, whether for reasons of terror or for political reasons. Now, once the crisis with China was on, the Indian military was so heavily committed that it was just not possible to, to focus on Pakistan. The third reason, as I mentioned earlier, is the economic and trade ties. It is not possible for India to completely cut its economic or trade ties with China. If India has to grow economically, it needs Chinese capital, it needs Chinese technology, it needs Chinese investment, it needs Chinese support. That is something which has become amply clear over the last couple of years. And every single government report, every single other report, despite the you know nationalist rhetoric in India, it has argued that we need to find a way in which we can still get Chinese money. We need to find a way in which we can still get the Chinese technology so that we can do better than what we are doing. Because unemployment, as you know, is at an all-time high in India. And the economy, is, while it is doing well in headline numbers, it is not really doing well for the masses of people who, who, ne- who inhabit India. And the fourth reason, which clearly you mentioned, uh, Eric, about the code, is definitely a factor. You know, in, in events where I've been with Chinese scholars or former Chinese government or military officials, I have heard this being spoken often, that one of the reasons that they would want to have peace with India is so that India does not completely align itself with the West and is still willing to, as you mentioned, run an independent foreign policy where it can still engage with China. So basically, it does not become the kind of a powerful country in Asia, which goes to the which goes to the other side. That is definitely the other reason. And the fifth reason, I believe, is that the United States and the West have been putting India under a lot of pressure, particularly on the issue of transnational repression, uh, where an Indian intelligence official, of, who is no longer an Indian intelligence official, has been sat, has been named in an indictment in, in a court in New York, And there's been a lot of pressure from the United States and Canada on this. And it really embarrasses India and particularly Mr. Modi to a great degree. Uh, They would want to shield themselves against all such kinds of pressure, even on the issue of Russia. If you remember when Prime Minister Modi went and met hugged President Putin in in Moscow, there was a lot of pressure from the Americans. The Americans issued a statement. They said, how can you go on the day there's a NATO summit on? So India would somehow like to maintain its independent foreign policy. And it's with respect to China that it needs the Western help the most. There was no way it could have dealt with China militarily, diplomatically, economically without help from Western countries. If India can find a way in which it can live peacefully with China, live in a more uh, amicable manner with China, its dependency on the West reduces greatly and allows New Delhi and Mr. Modi to follow the kind of policies, whether they are what the the West may say are are authoritarian, hyper-nationalist, Hindu-majoritarian, anti-minority, those kind of policies he can easily follow without coming under pressure from the Western country. Following up on that, as you mentioned, there is the, the ongoing dispute with Canada around the possible targeted killing of an activist in Canada by possibly Indian forces. And, you know, that has flared up recently again. And so I was wondering, you spend a lot of time in the United States, you know, I was wondering how you see a closer, friendlier relationship possibly between India and China playing in the United States, particularly considering that, uh, you know, a, a lot of the framing within United States foreign policy thinking over the last while has really depended a lot on on this idea that India is implacably anti-Chinese. How would that shift kind of foreign policy thinking in, in the United States? 
Oh, definitely. Uh, Corbis, this is a, that's a very important point because somehow there's been a mistaken belief in DC, particularly in a certain section of people who dominate the government and the think tank read that somehow India is anti-China and being anti-China is the only way India can exist and thrive. And therefore, there is something where, where the United States must work with India, even if there are other issues. And I'm sure that today's announcement is likely to raise questions in Washington, D.C., about whether India is committed to being anti-China or India is anti-China only because it has certain disputes in the border, which have not been resolved. And India otherwise fundamentally does not have any problems with China other than the border dispute. As earlier Xi Jinping said, and as even Prime Minister Modi has earlier said, the two countries can actually grow together and, and really bring about uh, Asia's century, as, as they say. So there's a possibility for cooperation with China, and that is going to unnerve a lot of people in Washington, D.C., because as you rightly said, Washington, D.C. has this completely a mindset which is completely against China and completely just, it, it just cannot consider China in an objective manner anymore. Yeah, well, they're not alone. I have a feeling that once the the dust settles from the kind of hyperbolic coverage that we saw on Monday, by Tuesday, the opposition Congress party, the Indian media, the think tank community in New Delhi is going to be at Modi's throat on this one. I mean, there is a very rabid anti-China sentiment in New Delhi as well that is pretty vast and pretty extensive. So how do you think it's going to be received within the kind of political commentariat class in New Delhi? Yeah, I think they will have to wait for the details. And until the time they don't get the details of what's going on, it's very difficult for them to criticize the government or criticize... Sushant, they are not going to wait. <laughs> Come on. The Indian media has no patience for anything. No, with Mr. With Mr. Modi, they have enough patience. They, they act like, as, okay. as they say, lap dog of Mr. Modi. That's what most media also act as. So, My goodness. So they were probably, and even the Congress party? You think the Congress party and the critics is going to... Yeah, the Congress party is... I don't know what Congress party is going to say, but my guess is that they will have to be more careful in their statement because they really don't know what the arrangements are. So they will have to be slightly guarded. Of course, they will be, they will be critical, uh, but I do not expect an all-out attack on what has been arranged. What I expect is more probing questions coming from people, and the queries as to, as to what really has happened. What have you conceded to China for China to agree to this? What exactly has China gained? What have you conceded? I think it will be more th those kind of questions that will come from certain people. But of course, yes, there will be some attacks. There will be some, especially if it is known that there have been some concessions that have been made, particularly if there's a statement from the Chinese foreign ministry or from the Chinese media or from Global Times or some other newspaper, which shows that, you know, there are some things which the Chinese have gained, which could possibly embarrass Mr. Modi or the Indian government. Then, of course, they would be attacked very strongly. And do you remember after the BRICS summit last year, they had this meeting between Modi and Xi, and Modi got upstaged by Global Times and the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs when they said that the meeting took place at the request of Modi, and that did not go down well. And so it's possible this week in Kazan, if there is a bilateral meeting between the two, that could change the direction of this discourse, but also, depending on how the Chinese respond to, that could undermine all of this. Absolutely. I would wait for the Chinese response. The only source of information, there are only two sources of information in this, Beijing and Delhi. Uh, Delhi has already spoken up in a very sketchy manner, giving providing limited details. If Beijing provides more details, and some of those details are not as positive as the Indian government currently is making them out to be, it could be very embarrassing uh, uh, for Mr. Modi. As for the last year's BRICS summit, I can tell you what I know from people who were in those rooms. It is pretty clear that it went off very, very badly. And therefore, the Global Times and uh, and Beijing then decided to come out and embarrass the India. There were a lot of expectations around that meeting, but it went off very, very bad. There's recently been pivotal elections and leadership changes around in India's immediate neighborhood, including in Sri Lanka, in Bangladesh, and in the Maldives. And in each case... That was framed and discussed in terms of, of India versus China geopolitics. And at the same time, in, in a recent piece of foreign policy, you were criticizing the Modi government for what you mentioned as like securitization of neighborhood diplomacy. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about both about the impact of these changes on India's regional position and how it kind of gets filtered through China-India issues in, in the discourse in, in India. Yeah, Kobis, that's a great question. And essentially, the point about China's rise in South Asia or China's increasing influence is that it has led to a diminished control which that, that India could exercise over the region. Now, every time, whether it is in Colombo, whether it is in Mali, whether it is in Dhaka, or whether it is in Kathmandu, these countries are making independent choices which are in their interest. 
it, if they are going to take advantage of this con- contestation between India and China, that is perfectly legit, and that's the way they should. They, any other, any other country w- would would do it. To portray this as a as a manner in which these countries have completely gone and sat in China's lap or are doing this at the behest of Beijing, I think is grossly unfair and is a mischaracterization of the whole thing. As we have recently seen uh, from Maldives, the Maldivian president was in India recently. He has signed agreements with India. He's agreed. India has agreed to support him. And this is the guy everybody said. President Muzu, everybody said, is completely pro-Chinese, and he's going to. This is the Chinese are going to control all the islands, and this is going to be completely ruled by China. But that's not the case. Same is the case we see in Sri Lanka, where the new president who has been elected is a well-known communist. The party that he belongs to, the GDP, has historically been anti-India. But even before the elections, he visited India. Indians were engaging with him. The first diplomat who met him after he was declared elected as the president was the Indian ambassador to Sri Lanka. So, you know, there's been, there's been massive engagement on that side. With Dhaka, the situation is, of course, different because the Indians believe that Sheikh Hasina was essentially someone they, they could work comfortably with, whereas the current leader is not uh, someone that they're, they're, Muhammad Yunus is not someone they're, they're very happy with. Happy with. In Nepal, India has friendly ties with all the all the parties, whether they are the Communist Party or the Congress or the Nepalese Congress Party. And the Nepalese Communist Party, despite being close to China or having had ties with China, have in recent years toned down their approach towards India and have become more friendly towards India. Chinese Communist leaders have visited temples, Hindu temples in in Mr. Modi's constituency in Varanasi, and have tried to engage as a fellow Hindu country, so to speak, uh, in New Delhi. So, you know, so there is a, there's a whole gamut of relationship. Now, what exactly has happened, Kobus, is that in the last two decades, the, sh- the rise in China's power and the, sh- and the relative decline in India's power in the neighborhood has made many observers and commentators in New Delhi extremely uncomfortable about this shift. Now, this is a shift which has happened, and this is a new reality with which India is Perhaps now, as I see it, accepted that it has to live with this new new reality. It can no longer be the sole dominant power in South Asia. The relative decline is a fact which India has more or less accepted. And India is now engaging with these countries, not trying to match China checkbook for checkbook or trying to you know push China out, but trying to engage them as independent entities and trying to win this battle of contestation and cooperation at the same time. That's a absolutely fascinating insight. And I guess I want to take advantage of your experience in the military, where you spent 20 years in the army. How do you think this is going down in the Ministry of Defense, who has been able to use the China threat in order to justify larger budgets, more aircraft carriers, long-range missiles? In fact, we just had the announcement this year of the first, I think it's an ICBM that can make it to Beijing for the first time from India. And then obviously contestation in the Indian Ocean region, where I th- it doesn't sound like the Ministry of Defense wants to completely give up on that, as they consider that to be their traditional sphere of influence. In fact, we just had an Indian warship dock in Tanzania this week, and so there's really a traditional sense that the Indian Ocean should not be relegated to the Chinese and that Indian military presence should be quite large. So how do you think any type of detente may go down in the Ministry of Defense? So one thing is very clear. Every single Indian military official has said that 2020 has made it clear that China is India's primary strategic military challenge. It is no longer Pakistan. And I think that is not going to change. And Arik, as you mentioned very clearly, this also allows them to seek larger budgets, seek more modern technologies, seek you know more resources, and gain more primacy mindset in the national landscape, so to speak. The second thing is very clearly this allows the uh, this adjunct allows in Indian military to walk away from this very heavy commitment that it has on the China border for the last four years, which had really stretched the particularly the army and put it under great pressure because large number of people had to be put up on the border and survive in these very inhospitable climates. Their family lives were disturbed and so on and so forth. And so that pressure would definitely go off, especially as the situation in Kashmir has not improved and situation in Manipur and India's northeast has not improved, which requires commitment from the security forces also. So, so that is the second factor which is definitely there. But the big point which you hinted at is very clearly that a lesser engagement on the continental borders allows India to divert its resources, its attention and energies towards the Indian Ocean region. It is in the maritime domain that India can really focus. Because one of the things that this commitment over the last four and a half years had done was that it was forced to devote its military resources, its attention, its energies towards that side. Once this happens, then India can perhaps 
devote more attention to flying its flag to other places, to provide more resources to the Navy, do more in the Indian Ocean region. Will that be in cooperation or co- and coordination with the Corps, or will that be done independently? That is something we'll have to wait and watch. So I wanted to ask you about popular nationalism on both sides and how this will play out in, in, in that in that context. So, you know, just from someone who, who dips into the Indian media relatively regularly, I was always struck by just how sharply nationalist the, the, the discourse is, how Indian development, for example, is always contrasted to Chinese development, is very frequently framed as a as a kind of a race between the two. And also, actually, you know, this is completely anecdotal, but like a, a friend of mine works quite regularly with a group of Indian engineers. And, you know, they come from India to South Africa, you know, on a relatively regular basis. And he's, he's, he's seen them over years, several years. And he, he recently just, you know, in, in a different conversation mentioned to me that over the years that he, that he met this group, they have become more and more sharply anti-China every time that he saw them. They become more and more like kind of unprompted, like kind of raising all kinds of kind of criticisms about China. And and we've also seen a very similar kind of hyper-nationalism kind of developing on the Chinese side, you know, being very, very sharply sensitive to to any kind of image, any kind of slight against China. So I was wondering, you know, in, in this against this background where popular nationalism has been has been a, a popular tool for, for ruling parties, both in India and in China, if there's a way to dial all of that back. That's not going to be easy. But in India, you can easily direct the nationalist uh, rhetoric or nationalist heat on towards Pakistan away from China. Like even in China, you can easily direct it towards Japan, as you know. You know, the primary nationalist target in China is Japan, not India or any other country. <laughs> Similarly, the primary nationalist target in, in India is uh, is Pakistan, particularly for Mr. Modi's uh, support base, uh, which is the hyper-nationalist uh, support base. But to give you a more nuanced answer to your, to, your, to your question, see, there is a lot of China envy in India. Everybody in India, especially amongst the Indian elite, recognizes that India and China were at the same level 30, 40 years back. And then China really took off in the last 25 years and India has been left behind. So there's a lot of China in me. The simple answer, a lot of people will say, oh, because China is authoritarian, because China can have these, they can do anything that they want. If we were not democratic, perhaps we, 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 would, ha- we, we, would, also be, we would also be similar. But then there are others who recognize that whatever China achieved under the Communist Party in terms of public health, in terms of public education, in terms of the kind of scientific advancement that it could easily make and could quickly move on, India did not make those kind of progresses. And therefore, India has suffered. So there is a kind of resentment, but there is also a kind of admiration for China, which which exists at the same time. And let's be clear, China is not the primary target of India's nationalist rhetoric. India's nationalist rhetoric is always primarily targeted against Pakistan, particularly by Mr. Modi and his party. And I would say this it's the same is true for China uh, under President Xi. The rhetoric is primarily targeted against Japan and not against uh, other countries. So if I'm going to summarize everything from your perspective, cautious optimism is how you would frame all of this. Is that right? Eric, absolutely. You caught us at the wrong time. This is just barely a few hours after these announcements have been made. <laughs> we, we've had very so little, cautious optimism. Yeah, we have had little time to pass these. But yes, cautious optimism. I would want these problems to be solved. But I would want to be problems to be solved in a manner where, uh, where India can do it respectively and without losing any of its strategic interests. That is what my desire There are a lot of details that are going to have to be worked out. And this is a very fragile process that can go wrong in any number of ways. So I think your advice on cautious optimism is well taken. Sushant Singh is a lecturer at Yale University's South Asia Studies Center. He's also a longtime journalist and serves as a consulting editor at the Caravan Magazine in New Delhi. And as you can tell, one of the smartest people out there when it comes to China-India relations. So thank you so much, Sushant, for getting up early to join us. We really appreciate it. Absolutely fascinating to hear your perspectives. And we're looking forward to following up with you after some of the details have come to light. Thank you so much, Aaron. Thank you so much, Corbus. It is a wonderful talking to you and a real honor to be on your show. Thank you so much. I echo Sushant's cautious optimism here. I think, again, there are a lot of ways that this can go sideways. But at the same time, this is by far the most important announcement that we've heard in years. And again, the only reason I'm taking this more seriously than previous announcements, and I can already hear people on Twitter and on our YouTube comments saying, Eric, you're reading too much into this. You, this is, you know, we've been down this road before. There's been expectations that relations are going to improve only to see them fall apart as happened uh, last year in Johannesburg. But the difference is, is that it we heard directly from Misery and from 
S.J. Shankar. This is not coming through the Indian media. You heard the sound bites at the beginning of the show that something big was coming. And so, you know, it's, it's interesting why the Chinese haven't responded. Again, I tend to think it has something to do with the timing before the, the Kazan summit, and they don't want to upstage Xi arriving at the Kazan summit. That is my guess. It's pure speculation, of course. It's unfortunate that we don't have anything from the Chinese side. But the magnitude of this, if it is in fact what people in New Delhi are saying it is, could be enormous. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the split between India and China has been one of the most dominant issues in Asian politics for years and years and years. So this is a, a major development. And it doesn't even have to be a full, they don't all have to be like holding hands and skipping, you know, kind of like it, 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 it's more a situation of every little slight or every little mistake being taken as a, as a confirmation of the other one being a, a full enemy, you know, like retreating back from, from that kind of default position, I think, you, you know, kind of would already be very helpful, I think, for, for, the, for the rest of the world. Um, I think also just you know, in you know, I, I frequently think back on on the Singaporean diplomat Kishore Mahbubani. You know, kind of talking, you know, saying and pointing out that that for for hundreds and hundreds of years, the India and China were the two largest economies in the world, and that they are slowly moving back in that direction. And so, you know, there's something kind of world historical about the relationship between those two countries because they're both so old and so large you know and so strong and economically so strong you know so they are the two the two future superpowers of the world in in many ways and you know and and for them to to have a better kind of working relationship is i think good news for everyone yeah kishore mabobani of course is the former united nations ambassador from singapore to the united nations uh, who was written extensively on china very supportive uh, of china for the most part but he also writes quite a bit about India as well. Let's talk about some of the winners and the losers in all of this, assuming that it unfolds in a certain way. And it comes right on the heels of mounting frustration uh, with Pakistan between China and Pakistan. We've seen growing terrorism targeted against the Chinese. We talked with Era Mashraf uh, about that a couple of weeks ago on the show. So I would say Pakistan is definitely a loser here in this if we see improved ties between India and China. China may see... Again, deeper, bigger interests in India. And again, uh, there is a sense of frustration in its all-weather friendship with Pakistan. Of course, we're not going to see an abandonment of Pakistan, but there could be a dialing down of the China-Pakistan economic corridor and maybe a shift of their attention towards India and South Asia. Certainly, as you mentioned, uh, the United States, I think this is, this is going to be a little bit perplexing for a lot of people in Washington who were convinced that Modi was on their side. In fact, Trump himself has spoken extensively about his amazing relationship with Modi. Uh, remember the speech that Trump gave India, huge crowds, but there was this new conventional wisdom that India had actually moved over into the U.S. column. I always thought that was just delusional. And any cursory reading of Indian history over the past 30, 40 years shows that strategic autonomy is the bedrock of Indian foreign policy. And so I think that is definitely going to be on the losing side of it. I think Sri Lanka is probably going to be a winner in all of this because India and China can coordinate better on debt-related issues, a dialing down of tensions over port calls for various navies. And in many ways, Sri Lanka is that, you know, the child caught in the divorced parents and, and, and you know, just saying, mommy, daddy, stop fighting. And them dialing this down definitely helps the smaller island states around India in the Indian Ocean. Oh, and I think the Philippines is also a big loser in all of this, because I think it does put more pressure on Ferdinand Marcos that he is standing now alone out there as kind of the more contentious, you know, powers confronting China over territorial disputes. What do you think of that rundown? I tend to agree, you know, with your your reading on, on these on these different players. In the immediate neighborhood, I think it'll probably be a bit of a relief, you know, in the large Indian Ocean, I think, because so many of these smaller countries, I mean, we mentioned Bangladesh, we mentioned Sri Lanka, the, the Maldives, but even smaller countries than, than those. Also, Nepal as well is caught in between these two. Exactly. You know, in, in, for countries like Mauritius and, and, and the Seychelles, for example, over a, a long time, 
so many of their of their choices in you know dealing with China and or India have, were then immediately framed in terms of oh but how will China and or India react you know so, so so I think I think that will will provide a little bit of maneuverability I think for 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 some of these countries because for for many of them but China and India the the two of them are their main investors main suppliers of things you know so 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 being being forced to choose between the two is is, is a tough thing for them I think I think I agree you know that I think Pakistan and Philippines are facing additional risk for different reasons I think for, on the Philippines side I think it comes I think different countries are making different calculations in terms of how closely they're stepping into a, a kind of a shared dialogue with the United States in which opposing China is a number one priority you know and i think i think that there's such a strong polarity around that issue within in washington dc that you know kind of it, like the ambiguity that the strategic ambiguity and strategic autonomy that that has been the hallmark of indian foreign policy tends to be become very flattened in in that dc conversation because in dc it's everything has to do with how much how anti china you are and not only that but but there's also like a, a default assumption that that being anti china only makes sense i think that the, the kind of complication of that narrative from from such a strong play as India is going to be very interesting to see play out, particularly at a moment where you know there is this kind of tension between Canada and India, you know, where the, where the United States f is finding itself kind of pulled in, in, into that into that dispute at the same time. So it's a very interesting moment. Yeah, the U.S. took the Canadian side on that, and the U.S. took the Canadian side default, and that really upset folks in New Delhi. Interesting that as Sushant was talking about the military pressures on the Indian side, I started to think, well, it might also be the case that there's some pressure on the Chinese side as well, because they've got a lot of forces deployed along this border. The Chinese defense budget, uh, if my understanding, if I remember correctly from the last time those numbers were revealed. It was increasing at the standard 7.2%, but it was not getting bigger increases. And the Chinese economy being what it is today means that there's a finite amount of resources that are going into the military. So it's possible as well that China did not see a long-term value in deploying so much of its military force down on the southern border with India in order to you know, redeploy those into the South China Sea and into southern China facing Taiwan. Let's not forget that last week I was in Taipei on the day that for the first time they had surrounded the island, both the PLA and the Coast Guard, with a massive show of force, greater than anything that they've done to, to date. So again, maybe there's a sense in the Chinese Ministry of Defense to this fight with India is not the one that we want to actually wage. The one we want to redeploy our forces to may actually be uh, with Taiwan and in the South China Sea. And given the limitations that the Chinese economy is putting on the, the defense budgets, uh, that too may have been a calculation. Of course, I am speculating wildly here because nobody really has you know, definitive insights into this, at least on the outside looking in, but it could be one of the possibilities to consider. Just to add to the wild speculation, I mean, you know, we're also at a moment where, where China is facing basically an implosion of Myanmar right across its border. You know, an ongoing civil war, it's increasingly looking like the, the junta might lose control of the country. And a lot of a lot of it is happening right on the border, and it's, it's already affecting very very expensive logistics connections that that China has funded, you know, like into Myanmar. So that's another another issue that that the Chinese military would necessarily have to keep an eye on. You know, so so one could see there like w why it would make sense to de-escalate on the Indian side. That's right. And just uh, on the Myanmar side of things, the PLA has in fact been deployed to the border now, and it's no longer a border patrol that is is patrolling the Myanmar. Uh, China border, but it is in fact uh, the, the the PLA, the the military that's there. Those of you who were not aware, also a Chinese consulate in Mandalay in Myanmar was attacked with uh, some kind of explosion, and the Chinese have issued a complaint to the Myanmar government. Uh, so you're right; the tensions with Myanmar are also uh, rising as well. Wow, so much to cover there. Again, I just want to put a couple disclaimers out there. At the time of this recording on Monday, the news had just broken. By the time you listen to this, the summit is already going to be underway. Modi and Xi may or may not have met. We have not heard from the Chinese side on this. We just want to make it very clear that we're not getting ahead of ourselves. We're trying not to get ahead of ourselves. But we do recognize that this announcement was a very important announcement. 
Whether it will stick is a different question. Again, the details, as Sushant pointed out, are absolutely critical in determining if this is in fact the breakthrough that many people think and a lot of people hope it is, at least in some parts of Asia, certainly not maybe in Washington. Kobus, let's leave the conversation there. want to thank everybody for joining us. And at the same time, also want to encourage you to support the work that the China Global South Project is doing. We've got teams in Asia, Africa, and the Middle East who are covering Chinese engagement in these regions. We're really the only news organization and, 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 and content outfit who's doing this kind of work, but it does depend on you. And for that, we are so grateful to our Patreon supporters who really make this possible, and also, of course, our subscribers of, as well. If you'd like to follow the work that Giro and Kobus and Johnny and the rest of the team are doing, go to chinaglobalsouth.com slash subscribe, and you'll find that subscriptions are very affordable. And uh, we're just so proud of the work we're doing, and we'd love for you to join our reader community. And also, just a reminder, if you are a student or a teacher, high school, university, graduate student, email me, eric at chinaglobalsouth.com, and I will send you the link for a half-off subscription that starts at just $10 a month. So for Kobus van Staden in Cape Town, I'm Eric Olander in Ho Chi Minh City. We'll be back again next week with another episode of the China Global South podcast. Until then, thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Follow the China Global South Project on Twitter at China GS Project and share your thoughts on today's show or head over to our website at ChinaGlobalSouth.com where you can subscribe to receive full access to more than 5,000 articles and podcasts. Once again, that's ChinaGlobalSouth.com.